Here's a video to get you ready for the quiz that's going to cover square roots, imaginary numbers, and solving with square roots. So this is the, the first topic that we're going to discuss, which is looking at radicals, learning how to simplify them, and talking about how to deal with imaginary numbers. So what you'll notice is whenever you do problems like this, the directions are always going to say simplify. And really what that means to you as the person doing the problems is you want to make sure that your answers do not have any decimals. We're looking for exact answers. I don't want you to punch this into your calculator and you get a decimal equivalent. One thing that will help you as you go through this is to have your perfect square list out. I would write it on the top of my quiz right whenever I get it because it gives you a reference point to look at throughout the entire quiz, not just on the material we're going to do here, but the material we're going to do the next day. So you'll notice that I put the perfect squares going from 2 squared all the way to 12 squared. And if you have trouble remembering them, you're just going to use a calculator and write down what is 2 squared, that's 4, what is 3 squared, what is 4 squared, what is 5 squared. So you can either have the list by memory or you can create your own list by using your calculator, write it across the top of your test, write it on every page. It may help you to kind of keep having that as a reference point. So when we start these problems, when we go to simplify it, we want to find the greatest perfect square factor of the number under the radical. And we're going to break it up into like a little tree. I call it a factor tree. Where we have 200, and we want to find the largest perfect square that goes into 200. So here's where you're going to consult your list. And you're going to look at this, and obviously the list could go even further, but we tend to stick with the first 12. 200, the largest perfect square factor of 200 is 100. So you're going to write down the factors 100 times 2. Now you want to take the square root of the one that is perfect, of the one that came from the list. So, so the square root of 100 is 10. That number comes in front because you've taken its square root. The other number, the number that's not a perfect square, is stuck. We think of it as like stuck in perfect square jail. We cannot get out of it. That was left under the radical. At that point, you are finished. You've taken out the biggest square root, you've taken the square root of that number, and the number that could not be square rooted is left underneath. That is called a simplified radical answer. If you look at number two, the only thing that's different about this one is it's negative. And we talked a little bit in class about how do we deal with negatives and square roots. Because if you try to put it on your calculator, it's going to give you an error. Because we always think of square roots as something we can't take the negative of. We actually have a way around that. We have what's called the imaginary unit, or the letter i. And the letter i is basically what allows us to take the square root of any negative number. For our purposes with solving, all it means is we have to make an i part of our answer. We always put the i in front of the radical. So we're going to have an i in front of my radical. The only, that's the only thing that's different. Everything else is exactly like what we just did on the previous one. So we're going to make a little factor tree. I'll have it go this way this time just for space. I want to find <coughs> the biggest perfect square factor of 75. If you look at your list, the largest perfect square factor is 25. <coughs> so we're going to write 25 times 3. Take the square root of the perfect one, 25. That is 5. It's going to go in front of the i. We always want to write the i right immediately in front of the radical. And then the 3 is stuck permanently under the radical. So you'll notice really not much difference between the first one and the second one. The only difference is because we started off with initially a negative number, we have an i with my answer. That's it. Next one <coughs> has one extra step. We have to multiply first. We have a product property for radicals. And what it says is when you have two radicals that are being multiplied, you're allowed to multiply what's underneath first, so 8 times 10 is 80, and then take the square root. So essentially, we have an early step to do in the beginning. Now we're ready to simplify. So same process. We want to make a little factor tree. We want to find the largest perfect square factor of 80. Here's one where you might get the, a number that's not big enough. Like A lot of people will look at this and say, well, 4. 4 is the perfect square factor that goes into 80. You're right, but it's not the largest. You have to keep going down the list. The largest perfect square factor is 16. 80 is 16 times 5. Take the square root of 16. That number comes out front. The 5 gets stuck underneath. My answer is 4, square root of 5. Next one, same thing. I can multiply these together first, giving me negative 96. Because there is a negative, there will be an i in my answer. Other than that, I want to do the same thing with my factor tree. I want to go through my numbers. This is another one where you might not get the biggest one. We end up with 96 is 16 times 6. So the square root of 16 is 4. We also have an i out front because we were dealing with a negative number. 
and then the 6 is permanently stuck under the square root. So we read this answer as 4i square root of 6, or 4i radical 6. Next few ones I want to look at is same idea simplifying, but this time they are ones that are fractions. One thing that we want to pay attention to with the fractions is you're not allowed to finish with a square root in your denominator. When that happens, we have to do something called rationalizing, which we talked about in class. First thing I'm going to do is I see the negative. Again, I'm going to pull that out front. I'm going to look for perfect squares. So if you notice right away, 100 is a perfect square. So that means I can take a 10 in the bottom, because the square root of 100. I have an i, and I have a square root of 7. So notice what I did. I brought an i out because there was a negative. I left 7 underneath, because not only is 7 not a perfect square, it doesn't have any perfect square factors. So if you think back to your list that's on the previous slide, 7 does not have a perfect square factors. And then I took the square root of 100, which gave me 10. At this point, this problem is done because you don't have a radical in the bottom. I'm going to show you one here in a second where you do have a radical in the bottom. We've got to fix that. Actually, the next one's a good example of that. When I look at this problem, I'm going to break it up separately <coughs> and write it as a square root of 10 over the square root of 3. You'll notice that neither of these are perfect squares, and 10 over 3 does not reduce. The way I rationalize it is I want to look at the bottom, and I want to take whatever radical's there, and I want to multiply by it on the top and the bottom. Because the bottom's the problem. I'm not allowed to have a square root of 3 on the bottom. So I multiply top and bottom by that problem value. Here's why that's so helpful. On the top, the square root of 10 <coughs> times the square root of 3 is the square root of 30. On the bottom, the square root of 3 times the square root of 3 is just 3. Because you get the square root of 9, which is just 3. You fix the problem. There's no longer a radical in the bottom. Now, the last thing you want to check is, are there any perfect square factors of 30? So 30 is 1 times 30, 2 times 15, and 5 times 6. None of those are perfect squares, so this problem is finished. The next one is an example of one that <coughs> you can actually reduce before you go through and start doing square roots. 40 over 2 is actually 20. And what you've done there is it's no longer a fraction. So you don't have to worry about having a square root of the denominator because there's not a denominator anymore. What I do have to worry about, though, is making a factor tree and seeing if there are any perfect square factors of 20. 20 is 4 times 5. 4 is a perfect square. So I take the square root of 4, which is 2, and I leave the 5 stuck underneath. So that one looked like it was going to be harder because it started off as a division, and it ended up being a lot easier. The last one. This one, 16 over 7 doesn't reduce. However, 16 is a perfect square. So I can take the square root of 16 and give myself 4. I can't do anything with the bottom. So I have 4 over the square root of 7. That's a problem because I can't have a square root in the bottom. So the way I fix that problem is I multiply top and bottom by that square root that's the problem. We call that rationalizing. On the top, I can't do anything with the 4 and the square root of 7. <coughs> because one's outside a radical and one's inside. On the bottom, I can do a square root of 7 times the square root of 7, which is just 7. I cannot reduce this anymore. I can't simplify it. This problem is done. I have one slide left, and that's looking at operations. Operations, what I mean by that is finding ways to either add, subtract, or multiply with radicals. If the radicals are alike, what that means is you have the exact same number under the radical. We are allowed to add them and subtract them, just like we did with like terms. It's like adding a 6x and a 2x. We get 8x. Well, this time we're taking 6 square roots of 5 and subtracting 9 square roots of 5, and we want to know how many square roots of 5 do we have. So all we're going to do is subtract those beginning numbers, like the coefficients, 6 minus 9. We get negative 3. The radical stays the same. Again, think of it like you're adding like terms with x's. You have a square root of 5 and another square root of 5. We just want to know how many square roots of 5. Compare that to the next one. The problem is these are not like radicals. We have a 48 under one and a 12 under the other. <coughs> if that's the case, then we need to find ways to simplify it doing factor trees, just like we did on the previous slides. So 48. 48 is 16 times 3. 12 is 4 times 3, finding that biggest perfect square factor. So I take the, perfect, the square root of the perfect one. So I take the square root of 16, and I get 4. But what you'll notice is I already have a 2 out front. So I have to take 2 times the 4 we bring out, giving me 8. So I had a 2 there. I took the square root of 16 and got 4. 2 times 4 is 8. The square root of 3 is stuck. Plus, now I'm going to do the same thing with this one. I take the square root of 4. That's 2. Multiply by the 2 that was already there, so I have 2 times 2, giving me 4, 
square root of 3. And what you'll notice is your end results are like radicals. We can add these up because they are both the square root of 3. So I have 8 square roots of 3 plus 4 more square roots of 3, giving me 12 square root of 3. And the last problem that I want to go through with you is foiling. Looking at two binomials, they both deal with radicals, and doing that first outside, inside, last. So first thing I want to do is multiply the 3 radical 5 and the 4 radical 5. 3 times 4 is 12. And then radical 5 times radical 5 is 5. So I actually do not end up with a radical here. I get 12 times 5, which is 60. My outer are these. I have negative 2 times 3 radical 5. I can multiply the negative 2 times the 3, giving me negative 6, but I still have a radical 5. Then I do my inner. I can do the 6 times the 4, which is 24, but I still have a radical 5. Notice I can only multiply the stuff that's outside together and the stuff that's inside radicals together. And then finally, my last, 6 times negative 2 is negative 12. I'm going to combine like terms. I have negative 6 radical 5 and 24 radical 5. Add those together, I get 18 radical 5. And then you'll notice I also have these pieces that are alike. They're both constant pieces. So 60 minus 12 is 48. So my final answer is 48 plus 18 radical 5. And I cannot add those together because 48 doesn't have a radical with it. And the 18 radical 5 does have a radical piece. So we cannot add those together. And we're done with this problem.